जय राधा माधव जय कुंज बिहारी जय राधा माधव जय कुंज बिहारी जय राधा जय श्री श्री राधा वृंदावन चंद्र की जय जगन्नाथ बलदेव सुभद्र महारानी की गौर निठाय की ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 4, Chapter 29, Verse Number 50, Talks Between Narada and King Prachinabharhi. Harir Deham Britam Atma Swayam Prakritir Ishvaraha Tatpadam Mulam Sharanam Yata Shemo Nirma Iha Harir Deham Britam Atma Swayam Prakritir Ishwaraha Tatpadam Mulam Sharanam Yata Shemo Nirmam Nirnam Iha Harir Deham Britam Atma Swayam Prakritir Ishwaraha Tatpadam Mulam Sharanam Yata Shemo Nirmam Nirnam Iha Someone chant? Hari, Sri Hari, Deha Britam, of living entities who have accepted material bodies. Atma, the super soul, Swayam, himself, Prakriti, material nature, Ishwaraha, the controller, Tat, his, Padamulam, Feet, Sharanam, Shelter, Yata, from which, Shema, Good Fortune, Nirnam, of men, Iha, in this world. 
So now Sri Narada Muni is speaking to King Prachinabharisha. And uh, this has been a long discourse, mostly not a discourse, but a narration of a personality who is attached to material life and doesn't know the goal of life. So using this uh, fictitious character, Narada Muni is speaking directly to the king who is the object of his, you know, preaching. In other words, he's talking, he's acting like he's talking about someone else, but he's actually talking about the king, just by using a different name. So now he's, now he says, now he gets right to the point, after using this, the analogies of the attachment of the soul within the material energy, now he says, my dear king, the entire world is covered, I'm sorry, okay, I'm sorry, that's verse number 50. Sri Hari, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, is the super soul and guide of all living entities who have accepted material bodies within this world. He is the supreme controller of all material activities and material nature. He is also our best friend and everyone should take shelter at his lotus feet. In doing so, one's life will be auspicious. Prabhupada's purport. In Bhagavad Gita, 1861, it is said, Ishwara Sarvabhutainam Riddhisher Junatishtati. The Supreme Lord is situated in everyone's heart, O Arjuna. The living entity is within the body, and the Super Soul, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, is also there. He is called Antaryami and Chaitya Guru. As Lord Krishna states in Bhagavad Gita 1515, he is controlling everything. Sarvasyacham rudisani visto matat smirtim jnanam apohanam cha. I am seated in everyone's heart, and for me comes remembrance, knowledge, and forgetfulness. Everything is being directed by the super soul within the body. Therefore, the better part of valor is to take his direction and be happy. To take his direction, one needs to be a devotee. And this is also confirmed in Bhagavad Gita 10.10. Tesham satatam yuktanam bhajitam priti purvakam tatam ibhuri hogam tam yenamam upiyantite To those who are constantly devoted and worship me with love, I give them the understanding by which they can come to me. Although the super soul is in everyone's heart, Ishwara Sarvabhutanam, Riddeshe, Rajuna Dishtati, he talks only to the pure devotees who constantly engage in his service. <coughs> in Chaitanya Bhagavat, Anchit 345, it is said, Tahase <coughs> Bala Vidya Mantra Adhyayana, Krishna Pada Padmaye Kariye Stilamana. One who has fixed his mind on the lotus feet of Krishna is understood as having been, have having the best education and has studied all the Vedas. The, there are other appropriate quotes in the Chaitanya Bhagavat. Seva vidya phala janiya nischayam krishna para padma yata chitra vrittaraya. The perfect result of an education is in fixing one's mind on the lotus feet of Krishna. That's from Adi Lila 13.178. Digvijaya kodiba vidyara karanahe ishvara bhajila se vidya satrakahe. Conquering the world by means of material education is not desirable. If one engages himself in devotional service, his education is perfect, is perfected. Pade kena loke krishna bhakti jana bade se yara nali he tabe viyaya kikare. The purpose of education is to understand Krishna and his devotional service. If one does not do so, then education is false. Tahere se bali dharma karma sadachar. Ishvara te priti janma samata sambara. Being cultured, educated, 
very active and religious, means developing natural love for Krishna. That's from Antya 344. Everyone has dormant love for Krishna. And by culture and education, that has to be awakened. Mm. That is the purpose of this Krishna conscious movement. Once, Lord Chaitanya asked Sri Ramananda Roy, what is the best part of the education? And Ramananda replied, that the best part of education is advancement in Krishna consciousness. Om Ajnan Timidam Dasya Gyana Jana Salakaya Chaksu Unmilitam Yena Naisi Gurave Namaha Sri Chaitanya Manobhistam Staptitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kedam Mayam Dadati Swapadanti Kam Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamani Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pacharine Nir Vishesa Sunyavari Pastyatya De Satarine Jai Sri Krishna Chaitana Prabhupada Sri Advaita Gadadhar Shiva Gauravakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna. Ki jai. We are very fortunate to have His Holiness Chandramali Swami Maharaj with us here today. Born in New Jersey in 1947, His Holiness Chandramali Swami Maharaj came in contact with Iskon in Denver, Colorado, when he was just a 24 year old boy. In 1973, he began practicing Krishna consciousness in New York City. And uh, shortly after that, he was sent to New Vrindavan Farm Community in West Virginia and he received initiations from Srila Prabhupada in 1973. I have heard uh, many pastimes of uh, my special master, His Holiness Radhanath Swami Maharaj and Chandramani Maharaj together in New Vrindavan. Uh, uh, Chandramani Maharaj used to cook and Radhanath Swami Maharaj used to offer the bhoga and uh, worship Radha Vandavan Chandra. Which Radha Vandavan Chandra? In? Nyavandavan, yeah. Nath. Uh, Nyavandavan Nath. Radhavandavan yeah. Nath. We were worshipping Radhavandavan Nath. Yes. There's three sets of deities, Radhavandavan Chandra, Radhavandavan Nath, Radhamadava. We were at the Brahmachari farm, we were worshipping Radhavandavan Nath. Yeah. They are expansions of Radhavandavan Chandra. <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, in 1986, he accepted sannyas order and began preaching in Cincinnati and Columbus, Ohio. And in 1990s, he became involved with ISKCON prison ministries in America. You must have seen a book by Maharaj on ISKCON prison ministry. Uh, Maharaj is very active in uh, preaching in the prisons of the West. He visited the, uh, he has been visiting the inmates and uh, holding programs and uh, he has been writing letters also to many of the fellows who, after reading the books, they ask queries to him and Maharaj responds to them. And also he sends them Prabhupada's books regularly to the jails. So, Maharaj has given lectures also on preaching in the prison. His only Chandramali Swami Maharaj is, is also now the leader of his Khan prison ministry and has worked tirelessly to document the spiritual progression of the worldwide uh, prison inmates community. His dedication to the welfare, growth and sustainable rehabilitation of these prisoners has culminated in the book Holy Jail, a touching compilation of the activities of ISKCON prison ministry. Probably some of you may be aware, in India, when Prabhupada had a desire to go to America and preach, he had some little difficulty in getting some uh, uh, sanction from the government. So one of the government officials had told Prabhupada that, if we can transform the heart of some of these people in prison, then we might consider giving you uh, the sanction. And our Srila Prabhupada also went to the prison and he preached uh, in the prison and uh, he showed very tangible results in prison preaching. So it was started by Prabhupada and uh, emulated and followed by His Holiness Chandramul Swami Maharaj also. So in over 30 years of operation, the lives of hundreds of jail inmates have changed due to the practice of Krishna consciousness. Uh, and the support received by the devotees. So, in 1995, uh, Maharaj uh, uh, began serving as a resident sannyasi in Chicago, 
uh, where he is based today also. Uh, currently, Maharaj travels to various places like America, India, Western Europe, Slovenia, Croatia, Italy, and UK. He is an initiating, initiating spiritual master within the ISKCON society. And uh, I have been uh, regularly getting to uh, associate with Maharaja uh, during the Pune Yatra programs and also when we have Yatras during Karthik month. And uh, uh, his lectures are very, very pure and pristine. He is a very great uh, speaker of Chaitanya Lila Katha also. And, uh, and very friendly and very encouraging and very inspiring. Recently when I was in Boston, Maharaj had come uh, to Boston to um, be there for a couple of days. I was so surprised when in the audience Maharaj knows dozens of people's names. He was calling them by names one by one. So Maharaj is very personal and friendly and very encouraging. And for Puna, Maharaj has been a very great uh, inspiration. Whenever he comes to India, he has been coming to Pune for three, four days in a row. And he goes to Kolapur, he goes to Belgaum, he goes to Nasik and various other places also. Uh, now I invited him and Maharaj kindly agreed to come for three days. This weekend is here. Tomorrow and day after, I am sure thousands of congregations will come and benefit uh, from Maharaj's association. Yesterday, we had a very powerful Brahmachari class in the afternoon. Maharaj said, I celebrate the day when I give up something, he was telling. Huh? When I give up my attachment to some of the things that I am holding. Although I was not personally here, I heard the whole class on Zoom yesterday. It was so amazing. Huh? So, Maharaj has been in the ashram for decades. And we can learn from him, uh, ideal Vaishnava lifestyle. Come, let's welcome Maharaj to Shri Chadam Dham Chandra Temple. Hari Bo! Hari Bo! Hari Bo! Hari Shyam Prabhu Ki Jai. When uh, His Holiness uh, Sridhar Swami Maharaj, Prabhupada's disciple, and Sanyas disciple also. He was preaching. He's left the planet in 2004. But when he was preaching, he came to he came to Pune a few times. And when he was preaching here, the devotees got really inspired. So the devotees wanted him to stay. So they said, Maharaj. We really want you to stay here. We need a sannyasi here. Please stay and preach. He said, you have one. His name is Radhi Sham. He said, <laughs> take advantage of him. He is actually a sannyasi <laughs> in the complete sense of the word. And he's totally renounced of all material activities and material attachments. And he's also one of the best preachers throughout, uh, you know, all the yatras that I can see. His preaching inspires so many people to come to Krishna consciousness and get involved in various programs. And I was just thinking by his mercy and the people that are working under him who are serving and assisting him in his, this, this wonderful temple has come up. So in a small place, Pune is not that small, but anyway, <laughs> It still has two major, major vibrant temples, and it's all, a lot of it is due, mostly due to His, his Grace Radhi Shamprabhu's hard work and dedication in preaching Krishna consciousness. So you're all quite fortunate to have His association and His direction. So this verse, uh, Prabhupada wants to emphasize one major point here and the word is education <laughs> I think the world is bent upon you know spending a lot of time and money becoming educated but material education is simply a covering over the real knowledge of the living entity as Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur says Material education turns one into an ass. <laughs> a pretty strong statement. And what is he saying? Because it makes you think you actually know something. <laughs> Where actually here it is explained that, you know, material education is not at all desirable because it is not really education. 
And this is actually proven by the etymological root word of the word education, which is a Latin word, which is educare. Educare is the root word of the word education. And educare, when you actually translate it into its basic principle, it means to bring out. So education really means to bring out something that is already there. <clears throat> it's not like you add something. Modern day education is where people go and they learn. They, what do they learn? Mostly facts and figures and numbers and like that. And they come out, they don't really have any way uh, how to live life. They're just good at somehow or other getting to get a job and making money by, you know, by juggling numbers. But that's not education. Real education means uh, Brahma Vidya. Or as Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, uh, what is that verse? Um, Bahunam jnanam amante, jnanam amprapadyante, vasudeva sarvamiti, samahatma sadur lobaha. So after cultivating knowledge for so many lives, one reaches the goal, hopefully, if they're on the right track, and that is that the real education means to surrender to the lotus feet of the Lord. Why? Because that is the purpose of life. Therefore, education, if it brings one to the purpose of life, it is actually beneficial. Otherwise, material education is, what is that verse in the Bhagavad Gita? Abhajanti mam mudham manushim tamanasvatam param brahma manasam mama bhuta maheshwar. People who have good education can't understand the nature of the Supreme Personality of God, and Krishna calls them mudhas. But there's another verse. What is that verse? Uh, 7.15 in Bhagavad Gita. What is the first line? No, that's another one. That's, that was, that's 9.12. 7.15. Uh, namam duskriti namudha papadyante naradama maya aparita jnanam that's asuram bhavama sritam. So maya aparita jnanam, Krishna says, is that they have knowledge, but they don't have knowledge. Their knowledge has been stolen by the illusionary energy of the material energy, which is making them think they know something. <laughs> you know, Prabhupada tells this one story. It's a little analogy. It's a nice little story. But one very educated scientist he wants to learn all about the culture of India, so he comes. And he has so many PhDs. And Prabhupada says, PhD, MA, BA, and uh, what is it, FIC? Someone asked him, what does FIC mean? Face in crowd, that's all. <laughs> Another face in the crowd. Or two BAs. If you have two BAs, then you're Bubba, right? BA, BA. <laughs> and, you, and you become a Bubba. <laughs> That's pretty much today's Bubba. <laughs> so, where was I? So, this great scientist, he comes to India. And now he's near the river bank, and he has to cross the river, so he. He knows he has to get a boatman. So one boatman shows up, and it's a very simple man. Doesn't have much, you know, possessions. He's dressed in somewhat simple clothes, and he rows his boat. So he gets into the boat, and he's taking the scientists across the ocean, or across the river. And while they're crossing, the scientist is looking at the boatman and thinking, hmm, he doesn't look like he knows anything. So let me ask him some questions. He said, you're a boatman, you should know what is the science of oceanography. Displacement of water per, you know, how energy affects water movements. <laughs> so the boatman says, what was that word you said? <laughs> and he, the scientist is trying to explain. He says, I don't know any of these things. All I know is I row my boat. So the scientist says, oh, well, actually, because you don't know, 50% of your life is wasted. So he goes on, 
And then the scientist again wants to test the boatman. So he says, Mr. Boatman, you know, here you are underneath the stars and there are so many galaxies and so many universes and so many planets. Do you know what it is astronomy, the science of understanding the cosmic, the cosmos? He says, I don't know anything. All I know is I row my boat. <laughs> So this, the, the scientist says, well now actually 75% of your life is wasted. So now they're getting across the, and then a storm comes and it's a big storm and it starts raining and the, the ocean, the, the, the water is just going like this and the boat is jumping this way and that way and the scientist is getting scared. And then the boatman says to the, uh, to the scientist, do you know how to swim? And he says, no. He says, well, 100% of your life is wasted. <laughs> and so what is the use of having all these educational carriers if it doesn't bring you to the lotus feet of the Lord? <laughs> and that's one of the forms of pride that the conditioned souls have a very strong attachment to, is having knowledge like them. And people think, they are better than others because they know, at least, they have memorized. It's not knowledge. Real knowledge is something that is n your actual nature. Actually, real knowledge is intuition. External knowledge is just an, a coat of paint over the surface of something. It's just, a, it's just information. But real knowledge is intuition. So spiritual knowledge is intuitive. What is that knowledge that Jiva Surupai Krishna and Das? That is that is real knowledge. And one who takes shelter of knowledge of Krishna is considered to be the most learned of all personalities. Why? Because they understood the goal of life. So here Prabhupada is making this point over and over again that through culture, what is that culture? That culture is the culture of understanding the difference between matter and spirit. <laughs> matter and spirit, there are different levels of knowledge. The basic principle of knowledge is to know that I'm not this body. So sometimes, when times we say, we, sometimes we say to a person, you're not this body. And then he says, well, whose body am I? <laughs> you're not, no, you're a nobody, actually. You're just a nobody. <laughs> That's another cliche. But anyway, the point is that people don't even know the difference between the body and the soul. There is one, there was one, uh, one of our preachers, he was preaching to some people in South America. And there was a very distinguished gentleman along with his wife. Both were quite, you know, aristocratic and quite cultured. So he's talking and he's saying, you know, you should understand that you're a soul. You're a soul, you're a spirit soul. And the lady immediately responded, she said, yes, I am a spirit soul. I'm a female spirit soul and he's a male female spirit soul. So this concept of bodily attachment is so strong that it actually it takes one to define even spirituality within the realm of material dualities. So this is, so therefore people are very much in ignorance, and therefore they can't understand I'm not this body. And it's very difficult to understand. And that's Krishna, what did he, he taught that at the very beginning. Real knowledge is, is a higher state, real knowledge is to know who you are and what is your relationship with everyone. So therefore, in the Shastras, there are three categories of knowledge, Sambandha, Abhideya, and Prayojana. And Sambandha means those things in relationship to. So before you can actually execute devotional service in an intelligent way, you have to know your relationships with all different categories of living entities. That's why Krishna teaches, and the Acharyas also, teach that the first principle is sambandha, connection. And out of all the Vedic knowledge, sambandha is the largest volume of knowledge. 
what is my relationship with God? What is my relationship with this material energy? What is my relationship with different categories of living beings? With people who are of the same level I, of practice that I am, of the guru, of people who are in lesser situations, different cultures, different national. What is my relationships with different types of living beings? What is my relationship with those living beings who are in bodies lower than human beings? So this principle of Sambandha is foundational to the execution of devotional service. Why? Because it awakens one's understanding of how to execute devotional service in because when we come in contact with various types of living entities and situations, a devotional service will be defined in relationship to that personality that we're executing devotional service in relationship to. Whether it's the spiritual master, our God brothers and God sisters, or just people in general. So Sambandha is foundational, and that's why that's so, there's so much emphasis on relationships. Now that's foundational to understanding Krishna consciousness. So here, again, education is actually knowing, and then there's a higher level of education, and that is what is the nature of God? <laughs> and what is my relationship with God? And then also, what is the nature of God? Then we get into the higher levels of transcendental knowledge, who am I in the spiritual world? What is my relationship with Krishna? What is Krishna's activities in the spiritual world? Just like people hear about spiritual activities, but they define it in a material sense. So that's why Bhagavatam is aligned in such a way to teach very systematically and very gradually a step-by-step -step process to understand various topics of spirituality in relationship to the ultimate principle Krishna in Vrindavan. That's why Prabhupada said people like to jump up to the tenth canto because they think this is where the this is where the nectar is. But then again, the other nine cantos explain that same person who steals butter, who plays with girls, who makes jokes with his friends, who doesn't listen to his mother, he's God. <laughs> but before you can understand that in a, in a clear sense of knowledge, you have to understand that he is Ishwara Paramakrishna, that he is the supreme source of all existence. He is the source of creation, he's also the source of maintenance, and he's also the source of destruction, although he uses these these qualities through his various energies. In other words, everything happens by the will of Krishna. What is that verse? Parashya Shakta Vihaya Suyate Swabhaviki Jnana Balakriya Cha. That all of Krishna's energies and all the facilities he needs to carry out the work of creation and maintenance and destruction, he simply thinks. He doesn't do anything. And simply by his desire, everything happens. He doesn't even have to think. They, actually, his energies know his desires, and therefore they carry out his will perfectly. That's Krishna. Now, and, and, and of course, we understand from Bhagavad Gita, what is that? Maya dakshena prakriti suyate sacharachanam hetunananda kontiya vibhava. What is that last? Vipartante. Not a blade of grass moves without the sanction of the Lord. Although, he is not the immediate call, he's the remote cause, which is making all the immediate causes uh, function according to how the living entities connect with him, either through the material energy or through the spiritual energy. No one can be separate from Krishna. Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, Yeya tam mam prapadyante tam stadaiva bhajamiyaham mama vartmana vartante bhanusya partha sarvasyaha. Everyone, according to how they approach me, either th directly in the spiritual sense or indirectly through my material energy, are worshiping me. Because the energies are all mine. Therefore, if you worship Krishna through the material energy, you're worshiping him indirectly. And so no one can get away from Krishna. It's not possible. 
He's everywhere. He's within everything. And he controls everything. And everything is uh, working uh, by his desire. I was just reading the Garuda Purana. Anybody read that Garuda Purana? And so you get an idea how tightly you're controlled. <laughs> how tightly you controlled. You can't even blink your eye without some demigod giving you the sanction to allow it to happen. Of course, he gives you the sanction because that's Krishna's desire. But everything is so tightly controlled that even the physical body you have is simply a culmination of your karma in your past life and all the details of your physical body are actually organized according to your karma. Amazing! <laughs> it's really, when I was, I'm still reading it, but I'm reading it now, it's amazing. The Garuda Purana gets into such details of the intricacies of all aspects of the material energy and how one is formulated, directed, and controlled by that energy. And one can't do anything outside of that energy. When one makes a move to try to change the direction that the material energy is pushing, the material energy simply switches and pushes that person in, 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 in the, back into the direction they were going. Unless they make another effort to change that direction in a concerted way, and the material energy just captures them a different way. So that you can get tied up by golden chains or you can get tied up by silver chains. You're still tied up. <laughs> so that the, therefore, the material energy is always capturing the living entity completely as long as the living entity... Therefore, what is the use of material energy education? Because it, as Bhakti Vinoda Kaur says, it just keeps you tightly bound within the idea that actually I have knowledge and therefore, what is my knowledge? I can manipulate the material energy. But you can't. You can't. Just like Prabhupada would use the example. Oh, you want to smoke. So you're smoking some cigarettes. And you're thinking, oh, I'm enjoying the cigarette. But the cigarette's controlling you. Mm -hmm. You're controlled by that thing that you're trying to enjoy. So this is the nature of material energy. So what is the use of this kind of material education? What well, just teaches you how to become more controlled. That's all. <laughs> the more knowledge you have materially, the more you're controlled by, that, by the material energy. And sometimes people try to cultivate detachment. So that's the beginning of knowledge. When someone starts to become detached from material activities, then their knowledge is actually taking them in the right direction. Now, people become frustrated by trying to enjoy material energy, and through that frustration they try to give up material activities, but they take up another form of material activities. So the scriptures say, those who falsely renounce material activities without taking up spiritual activities are in another type of material attachment. They're attached to their false ego, that's all. They're still bound up by the material energy, but in a way that they can't see it as much as they used to see it. They're more controlled on the subtle level and not on the gross level. And that's the ganis. The ganis are controlled more on the subtle level. So therefore, material education, any of it, is simply um, more and more bondage. Therefore, to cultivate transcendental knowledge is a step-by-step -step process of awakening our ultimate uh, relationship with Krishna in pure devotional service. Then, by carefully studying Srimad Bhagavatam, going through the different cantos and understanding what is the different topics in Srimad Bhagavatam. Srimad Bhagavatam contains ten topics. Uh, uh, I'm not sure of all the topics. One is creation, one is the sub-creation, one is protection by the Lord, one is the, uh, the control by the Manus. There's ten topics, and ultimately asraya. 
Asraya is the supreme shelter of all the energies and all the educational topics that are given in the Bhagavatam, and that's Krishna in the tenth canto. So therefore, by studying carefully Srimad Bhagavatam, one can understand how the how one is gradually coming to the stage of pure knowledge, and then one, when one becomes ready, then they can understand Krishna's pastimes in Sri Vrindavan Dham, which is ultimately the goal of this Krishna conscious movement, is to come to the level of actually understanding Sri Krishna and Sri Vrindavan Dham, because we are followers of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is Sri Krishna Chaitanya Radha, Krishna Nahiyanya. He is Krishna and within the mood of Radharani, in the mood of a pure devotee of, who is the pure devotion of Srimati Radharani, teaching from the platform of a, a student. How, what is pure devotional service and how to execute that pure devotional service. So therefore, what is he teaching? The mood of Sri Vrindavan Dham. So that is the goal of our Krishna consciousness movement, to qualify ourselves to enter into that consciousness of Sri Vrindavan Dham. In other words, to understand the, to some degree, no one can understand completely, what is the nature of the spiritual world and how Krishna uh, is interacting with his loving devotees and pure devotional service in the spiritual world, free from any inebriates, just like love in the spiritual world is completely selfless. Prabhupada said love in this world still has the element of personal motivation. Prabhupada said the highest form of love you can find in this material world is the love of a, a mother for her child. That's practically selfless. And of course now that's losing its its selflessness due to the modern civilization where now a lot of the women are seeing their children as being a burden because they want to do other things and they have to take care of their children. So that's becoming now changed by the, what we see, the fast moving lifestyle of the technological society where now women are becoming thrown into the workplace and they have to take care of their children at the same time, it's very difficult. So some do that, due to that, the women are sometimes even feeling a little regret towards their children that they have to spend so much time with them. I've seen that, maybe not in India so much, but in Western countries, where even devotee women are even thinking that my children are making it hard for me to practice Krishna consciousness because I have to take care of them and I want to chant, I want to go to the kirtans, I want to do that. Yeah, this is, I was approached by some ladies who were talking about a whole other group of ladies who think, wow, you know, we want to, we have to take care of our children, that's nice, but it's becoming a burden because we really want to be Krishna conscious. And But the real solution is make your children Krishna conscious and then you'll be Krishna conscious too. <laughs> Bring them along to all the and teach them what is the the real values of life and how to practice and uh, experience you know Krishna consciousness. So yeah, so that pure love that is there within the heart of a mother for her child is actually the closest thing you can get to transcendental love, where there's no motivation for oneself but only the care of another living entity. But in the spiritual world that has reached perfection where there no one has any other desire than to please the object of the of love. And even if they have to just like it says that said Radharani, she wants to give Krishna more and more pleasure. So she knows Krishna likes to be with other gopis. So although she wants to be with Krishna Krishna also wants to enjoy the other gopis, so sometimes she facilitates the other gopis by going to the other gopis and teaching them how to satisfy Krishna in the best possible way. She's perfect in that category. Only she knows how to satisfy Krishna perfectly and completely. 
and she wants Krishna to have that in all situations, so she goes to the other gopis and teaches them how to serve Krishna nicely. So she sacrifices her own desire to be with Krishna in order to please Krishna by allowing others to come to serve Krishna nicely. So that's love. <laughs> that's love. So sometimes you receive and people say, ah, oh, well, I love my country. I love my dog. I love my cow. I mean, my car. I'm sorry. <laughs> I love my car. You can go in America, you see these bumper stickers. Uh, my wife, maybe. My dog, maybe. My car, never. In other words, don't touch my car. You know. <laughs> yeah, this is a real bumper sticker. <laughs> I'm not just making this up. <laughs> Cars, like you know, who? India is also getting you know car conscious. <laughs> Instead of cow conscious, it's becoming car conscious. <laughs> because education is taking one away from Brahma Vidya and towards that you've got to have so much technological advancement or else we are seen as a, a poor country or it's not up with the rest of the world. We haven't understood the, the actual happiness that the, with the rest of the world. Prabhupada said, yeah, you just come to the Western world. You just think, oh, so much nice happiness but it's like an apple that's nice on the outside, but when you cut it open, it's rotten in the inside. It looks nice, and that's Western society. It has a nice polished veneer. It very, looks very pleasing from the external point of view, but when you get right into it, you see it's something different. It's something different. And so that is, you know, but so India is chasing after this West and thinking that we need this kind of education, otherwise how can we make money? Making money, Prabhupada said, the only one who's making money is the government, that's all. <laughs> Nobody's making money. They print the monies all the time, so they're always making it, right? <laughs> Nobody makes money. <laughs> they give you, you work hard and they give you a piece of paper with somebody's face on it and say, here, here, now you have a hundred rupees. But it's just a piece of paper, that's all. <laughs> it's just paper. It has, the value is simply the government's uh, stamp on it. It's not really wealth. Real wealth is what? Land, cows, precious metals. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you have land, you have wealth. If you have livestock, cows, horses, you have wealth. If you have precious metals, you have wealth. If you have paper, you're an illusion. <laughs> the Prabhupada gives a whole talk. You can look it up. It's uh, December 31st, 1973, a morning walk conversation. Prabhupada talks about the whole, the whole cheating process of today's modern wealth yeah, arrangements. You work hard, they give you a piece of paper. Here, this is for your work. <laughs> so they cheat you. <laughs> so yeah, so this is today's society. So therefore to pursue material education is necessary up and in. so what is that pursuance of education? How to maintain the body. That's all. Material education can help you how to maintain your body. But that's about it. But actually, even if you become Krishna conscious, Krishna actually facilitates maintaining your body. He does it through arrangements, through the material energy. So therefore, real knowledge is to understand who I am, who is Krishna, what is my relationship with Krishna, and how to act in that relationship and achieve the goal of that activity and is Prema Pumartha Mahan, develop love of God. Why? That is, that is the perfection of education. 
So it's not how much you know, it's not how much of the right thing you know. <laughs> you know, if you know one thing that's right, that's better than everything that's wrong. <laughs> and what is in Prabhupada says here, those who know that the lotus feet of the Lord are the only shelter, they are highly educated. <coughs> That's the perfection of education. There's no other shelter in this world than the lotus feet of the Lord. And one who would understand that, Prabhupada says, for the scriptures say they have studied all the Vedas. Yasya Devi para Bhaktir, Gita Devi Tata Guru. One who has complete faith in the lotus feet of the spiritual master and of the Lord, all the imports of all Vedic knowledge automatically come within the heart of that living entity. Simply by attaining that complete faith in the lotus feet of the spiritual master and Krishna combined. Why? Because in that knowledge, in that shelter, there is complete knowledge and there's complete happiness. Mm -hmm. Because the soul is by nature chit. Mm -hmm. Chit is part of your nature. Chit means that, that complete and perfect knowledge. Okay, any questions or comments? Um, anything related to this verse? Uh, Radhi Shamprabhu. The general mass of people uh, these days are in a very great uh, state of anxiety and stress uh, to make their material life, uh, you know, uh, go on, uh, due to which the spiritual inquiry has become very uh, uh, greatly lacking mm -hmm. in people. Because the, there is inquiry, but the inquiry is more about uh, eating, sleeping, mating and depending. You know, how to keep our material life successfully going. So, uh, in such a situation, uh, when we come across new people, and when we talk about uh, the message of uh, spiritual world, the message of God, most new people, uh, they have a big question mark on their face. So, how would you uh, address uh, a crowd of new educated people when you would meet? Uh, because they are uh, practically ignorant and uh, what would be the best way to inspire them uh, to come to Krishna Consciousness? Are you talking about educated people, how to inspire them from that pr perspective? Mm -hmm. Well, inspire them to, to read our books and learn about, now you're, you have so much education, here try to understand this knowledge because this knowledge is the king of education try to encourage them to read the books and try to uh, get this type of education also. If they're so enthusiastic to learn things, then why not play on that enthusiasm to learn now spirituality like that? Because there are people who do like to collect knowledge. <laughs> I remember I went to one professor's uh, office in one university where I was asked to give a class. Before I came, I went to his office, and uh, his the ceiling on his room was almost to the ceiling on this here. It was really high. It was up to the chandeliers, and he had books on three walls all the way up. Couldn't even reach them. What to speak about reading them? Yeah. And I was looking at it. I was thinking. Did you read all these books? <laughs> I didn't say it. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. So, people, are, there's people who like to, you know, all they do is collect knowledge or they collect information, basically. So, you can inspire them in that same, what we say, uh, nature is all right. Here, it says that if you, that if you have big brain, and try to understand the mercy of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. <laughs> Prabhupada says you won't because no one can understand that mercy. It's beyond anybody's ability to understand. But still, so you can you can challenge them in a very well respectable way.
to take up learning this type of knowledge and add it to your categories of knowledge. But when they start reading our books, they'll start realizing they're in how useless their other knowledge is. <laughs> At least they'll hear from Prabhupada. <laughs> That's one way to inspire them. Yeah. Any other questions? Looks like everyone wants to take breakfast. Okay. <laughs> That's, that's high knowledge, because <laughs> if you take prasadam, automatically your knowledge increases. <laughs> so, thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai, Srimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai. Hare Krishna. So, there is a Brahmachari class by His Holiness Chandra Mauli Swami Maharaj at 3 o'clock in Bhaktivedanta Hall. So, all, all students are invited. Hare Krishna. And Brahmachari is also. Hare Krishna, so there is a wonderful breakfast prasadam, is there in Mukunda Hall for everyone, so all devotees can take benefit of that. Hare Krishna.